Okay, just a quick sound check. Can anyone hear me okay? Just give me a thumbs up in Discord or louder, softer, if I'm too loud or too soft. Excellent, thank you. We'll get started at nine.
Okay, it's just clicked over to nine o'clock, so I'll get started. For those of you who haven't met me, net, met me yet, my name's Sarah and I'm one of your three lecturers for ENG1003. Steve's taking a well-deserved break this week, so I'll be going through functions with you. Um, as per usual, any Q&A will be on the Discord um, questions lectures channel and Brenton will be there driving the Discord today. Uh, I've posted all of the code I'll be using today in the Discord channel called lecture code. So if you want to play along as we go through some of the examples, you're welcome to do so. You can cut and paste the code from there and run it in um, your PyCharm at home. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, this week is functions. And we've already used functions in this course, actually since the very beginning. But the difference this week is that we're going to learn how to write our own. Okay, so some, some terminology first. So what is a function? A function is actually just a block of code that you think or know that you're going to use multiple times. And you simply don't want to have to type it out again and again every time you use it. So you declare it as a function, give it a name, and then even any time you want to run that code, you call that function within your main code and it will run the code for you. Okay, so they're primarily used when you want to run the same block of code again and again, as I said, but they can also be used for other reasons, such as to make your code tidy, uh, easier to read, and also to share coding tasks with a large group of people. You can assign different functions to different people, and all you have to do is define what the function does, and then they can go away and separately work on the function while you're working on some other part of the code. Using functions makes it much easier to share code with others as well. Okay, so a function, what do we require? It's actually quite straightforward. We need to decide what the function is going to do. And then all we have to do is decide on a name, uh, a name that hopefully is not too long, so it doesn't take too long to type, but is long enough that it conveys enough information about the function that you can probably remember what it's called when you want to use it. Now, a lot of functions have a return value, which means that when you call the function, it does something and then returns something back to the main code that's, that's of use to the rest of the code. And a lot of functions have arguments, which is values you give the function in order for it to be able to calculate or enable to do the task that you want the function to do. And we'll see some examples of this as we go through. So you've probably heard the word function before because you've used them in mathematics. So in mathematics, we see a lot of functions that look like y equals f of x. f is the function. Now that could be many, many different things. It could be sine, it could be cos, it could be 3x squared plus 4x plus 6. So a function is just described some, in maths, some mathematical operation you'll do on the argument, in this case, x. So when you put a value of x in, um, the function will return the answer for that value of x, and then the answer will be still assigned to the variable y. So we have an argument, variable x, and a return variable y where the answer is stored once you've calculated the function. So this idea of a function, an argument, and a, an assignment to a return value is exactly the same in maths as, as it is in Python. So this is why the terminology, the word function is used in, in Python and indeed in all coding languages. Um, but the similarities stop there. There's a few more things that are different about functions in Python from what you've seen in maths. And a key one, of course, is that functions in Python can do more than just maths. So they can do all the things that function can do, uh, all the things that Python can do in regular code. Okay, so what happens when a function is called, as you're running through your normal code, a function is called, execution jumps to the function, does whatever the function is supposed to do, and then jumps back to the code where it left off. So for example, in your code that you've been writing in the last few weeks, you may have had a sign function, um, and you've put in an argument, a value that you want to calculate the sign for. In the background, when Python has seen that sign function, it's jumped away to the code that calculates sign, worked out what the answer is, and then sent it back to your main program. So if you've written y equals sine of x, then the code will run, it will calculate what the answer is for that sign function, and then return the value back to store it in y. Okay, so some functions can return more than one value, and we'll see that a little bit later on. And some functions can also return no values. And in fact, we've already used one of those functions, such as the print function in Python. So the key thing here um, with Python is that the functions can be any valid Python code, such as printing something to the screen. They don't have to just do mathematics. Okay, so as I said, we've already used several functions in eng1003. So these are either 
built-in Python functions like print, or we've imported them from some of the libraries like NumPy. So for example, our square root function um, that we may have used from NumPy come, was, is defined, the function definition is in the NumPy library. And the random function that you saw last week, there's a function definition in the random library. So when you do that import um, instruction in your code, what you're actually importing is all of the function definitions that have already been written for you. So you don't have to define a function square root or a function random yourself. You can use the function definitions that have already been written for you in those libraries. And the function called syntax is in your code, you have to write the name of the function, followed by some brackets and inside the brackets are all the arguments that the function requires. So for example, the sign function requires the argument, which is the value you want to take the sign of. The print function takes an argument, which is the string that you wish to print out to the screen. Although not all functions take arguments and you have actually seen an example of a function that doesn't take arguments in, in the random function. So square root print random are three functions you've already seen. Um, and so we'll go through them one at a time and use them to explore some of the terminology around functions. Okay, so example one. This is a function that Steve went through with you last week, the random function. And you found that function inside the random library. A bit confusingly, the name of the library is the same as the name of the function, but that's okay because you've already, you've already seen this before. So what does the random function do? It returns a random number between zero and one. And this random number that it returns is assigned to x because we've written x equals random dot random. Now the random function is one of those functions that doesn't take an argument. You don't actually need to give the random function an argument. So when you call that function, you still put the brackets in, but you leave it empty. Another function, that you may have used is the square root function from the NumPy library. So square root is the function name, SQRT is the function name, and that function has been defined in the code for the NumPy library. In this case, x, it, the square root function has an argument, x, you have to tell it the number that you want it to calculate the square root from. It also returns a re return value, which is the answer, the square root of x, and that return value is assigned to the variable y. So we've seen two examples of functions, one without arguments or one with arguments, both of which have return values. In this case, the return value is stored in x and in this second example, the return value is stored in y. So another function you've seen from the very beginning is the print function. And this is an example of a function which doesn't have any return value. So when you write print brackets, the string inside those brackets is your argument. Um, and what the print function will do is it will go away and it will print whatever that, screen, that um, string is to the screen. So there is no return value. Technically, um, it does return a value, but that value is called none. So if in your code you were to write y equals print, hello world, and then you were to investigate what the value of y was, it would actually have a value none. But even though this function doesn't actually return anything useful to your main code, it is still a useful function because it does something for you. It prints something to the screen. So these three examples from um, functions you've already used throughout this course give you the three different modifications on functions, whether they have a return value, whether they have an argument. Okay, so an engineer's view on what we say by the return value. So you can think of the return value is the value a function gets replaced with in a line of code. And what do we mean by that? What we mean is that functions can be used in your code in the place of um, any, any part of your code where you would have a variable or a literal. So a variable is your x or your y, and a literal just means a constant. So if you were going to write print one, for example, um, or print something with the value one, that's called a literal because it's a constant one. Anywhere in your code where you use a variable or a literal, you can instead use a function. So in arithmetic, uh, we, we've done that uh, already in your recently assessed lab. You used a function sine or cos or some other function depending on your lab. And the value of that function was used in a mathematical expression, an arithmetic expression. So you might have 
had three times cos of x, for example. And so you, you had a function and then the cos of x was replaced, that value was replaced inside that function, then it was multiplied by three to calculate the answer inside that equation, I should say. You can also use functions inside conditions. So, so if then else statements or while statements. So down here, for example, the last line says while cos of x is less than zero. So this function cos, we're using it inside a condition, inside a condition for this while loop. And we're also using it as an argument. To, we can also use functions as arguments to other functions. So if you look at this second um, example down here, we have a print function, but inside that print function, we're calling the sign function to work out one of the values we want to print. So all of this here may sound a little bit technical, but it's all things we've already done. We've used functions to return values, and we've used those return values in lines of maths, in arithmetic, in some of our if then else or while conditions, and as arguments to other functions. Okay, so, so far we've talked about things you've already done. Now we're going to talk about the new stuff. And the new stuff is where you get to write your own functions. So what do you need to do? There's a six step process if you, if you want to write your own functions. First of all, you need to know what the function needs to do. And nobody can tell you that for you. If you're writing the function, then you yourself needs to define what that function needs to do. Then you choose a name, hopefully a name that's a little bit descriptive. Then you decide on what the function parameters are. So what are the information that the function's going to need in order to be able to do the job that you want it to do? You need to decide on what the function needs to return. So what is it that the code that's calling this function, that's using this function is going to need to know after the function's finished? Then you need to define the function, which means write the code that tells Python all of these pieces of information. And finally, after the function's defined, you can call it in your code wherever you need to use it. And you can call it just the way you call the print function or the cos function or the sign function by writing its name and by giving it some arguments. Okay, so let's use our first example. So in week one, we saw how to calculate the height of a ball at a given time t, given an initial velocity v0. And we specified a constant g equals 9.81. And then we just wrote down the mathematical equation based on some simple physics on how you calculate the height of a ball based on v0 and t. Now we might want to calculate um, that height multiple times for different values of t. And let's assume for a moment here that we're not going to use arrays like we have done in the past. We're going to be calcul calculating those values one at a time. But we're going to need to do it multiple times. So we want to write a function and call it every time we want to calculate the height of a ball. So first, before we do that, let's make some design, design decisions. What are we going to call the function? Now, from my point of view, I think a good name would be ball height. It describes what we're doing. We're trying to calculate the height of the ball. So in the textbook, um, the name of this function is has been called y, which um, from my point of view, I don't think is a very descriptive name. So I'm going to call it ball height instead. Now, what information does ball height need in order to calculate the height of the ball? What are its arguments or its parameters going to be? And I'll describe the difference in a minute. So it needs to know v0 and it needs to know t. It also needs to know g, but for a moment, we're just going to um, assume that we know g, but we'll define it inside the function. And finally, it needs to return something. So it needs to return y, which is the height of the ball. And here we go. Here is the code we already knew what to do. We had to define g, and then we had to calculate the height based on this mathematical expression. But to turn it into a function, we have to do two things. We have to put a wrapper around it, which consists of a function header and a return statement. The function header starts with the reserved word def, which stands for definition, which means here I'm about to define the function. So I always write, the first thing you write if you want to define your function is def, 
Then the function name, which can be whatever you want. I'm calling it ball height. Open brackets and then a comma separated list of all of the parameters that this function is going to need to know in order to calculate the result that's needed. Close brackets once you finish listing all of the parameters and then a semicolon. So that is the, what's called the function header. And it tells Python that coming up next is the definition of what my function ball height is going to do. We indent the lines of code inside a function, just like we indented the lines of code inside a loop. Four spaces or a tab uh, is pretty standard here. Now inside this particular function, I'm going to do two things. First of all, I'm going to decide on a value for G, which is our gravity value. So G equals 9.81. Then I'm gonna write the equation for the maths that I wanna do. In this case, um, we already know that equation, we saw it in week one. And these lines of code are called the function body. Lastly, I need to let the function know what it has to return back to the main code after it's finished. And in this case, we want it to return the value y we just calculated, the height of the ball. So there's our function definition. Now, once we've defined our function, we can use it. And we use it in our main code, just like we've used all the other functions um, that other people wrote for us, just by calling it with the name and with some arguments. So here is my new code where I'm going to call this function a couple of times. So I'm going to set my initial velocity to five. I'm going to have time one at 0.6 seconds. I'll calculate the height. Now I want a new time, 0.9 seconds. I'll calculate the height again. And I don't need to rewrite the equation both times. I can just use my function now and it will give me the return value that I need. All right, so let's see if we can see that um, with some examples in Python. Okay, why are you not exiting out? There we go. So I'll make this live so you can see it. Okay, so here's the code that we would have um, had in week one where we're not using functions. So I'm going to decide on my V naught, my T, my G, and I'm going to calculate my height with an equation. And then I want to do it again for another T. So I define my new T and I calculate my height for that new T. And I'm going to print out both things. So let's see if we can make that run. So here we go. So at time t naught, we've calculated one height, and at time 0.9, we've calculated the other height. Okay. So all of this should be pretty uh, straightforward. This is the kind of the things we've been doing all, all the way in this course. But now let's turn it into a function. So I make myself some space, and I'm going to define a function ball height, which is going to calculate the height of the ball for me. So I just said we start with the reserved word definition. Then we need the name of the function. Now I'm using a convention where a uh, function name with two words, I use underscore, so ball height. Um, equally valid is if you want to use say camel case where you might write it like this, where you put the two words together without the underscore, but you use a capital for each word. Up to you. Um, it's just a style preference. It doesn't really matter in terms of um, the Python code, but it's always good to, to pick a style and, and be consistent with it because it helps you each time figure out what the names are for all of the functions that you're calling. Okay, so this function is going to need some parameters in order to calculate uh, the height of the ball. It's going to need to know um, V naught, the initial velocity, and it's going to need to know the time t. And there we go, I finished my header with a colon. So nicely PyCharm's indented for me because it's realized that I'm now defining a function. So let's see, what do I need to do inside this function? First of all, I need to define what gravity is. Then I need to calculate the height of the ball, which I'm just going to cut and paste from here because I already have, oops, I already have that line of code. 
So there we go. Here is the entire function ball height. One last thing I need to do is return. Let my function definition know which value I want to return. And I want to return y, which is the value I just calculated as the ball height. Now, in my main code over here, instead of writing the equation again, I can just call the function. And I can tell it what I need to know. So I need V0. And I need to know, I think in my slide I called it time one. So let's call it time one. Okay, so here is my main code, um, uh, which has to come after the function definition. If I'm going to call a function, I need to define it first. So function definition at the top, and now my main code. So I've defined V0, I've defined my time, and then I've called my function. Now, if I want to call it a second time, let's call this one time two, then I, my height two, instead of calculating it again, I just call my function. But this time, instead of passing in time one as my argument, I will pass in time two as my argument. And then I need to time one and time two. All right, so let's confirm that this code, which has turned that uh, mathematical equation into a function and then called the function, works just as well as it did before. Okay, why am I not seeing the console? Let's run this way. Okay, so there we go. Works beautifully. At time 0.6, the height is 1.234. At time 0.9 seconds, the height is this rather large number here. So, we're done. We've learned how to write and we've learned how to call functions. So that's pretty much the content of the lecture today. Um, the rest is going to be details, but let's get to some of those details. Um, okay, so here was the function we just ran. And um, some of the things that I already said as I was writing the code, but I'll repeat and I put in the slides for when you're looking back at these things. So the function definition must be before the function's first use. So in the code you just saw, I actually defined the function and then I called it. But you can also include a function from a library as well in order to define it. But again, that include statement must come before the function is first used. Um, so there's those two options, but as long as you define the function before you used it, that's the key point here. So some terminology, the first line in the function definition is the function header. So def ball height v0 t colon is the functions, function header. It must start with the def, then the name of the function, and then the function parameters, which are the values required by the function in order to do its calculation. Okay, after the function header is the function body, which is all the lines of code inside the function. And these must be indented, four spaces, a tab, um, whichever works for you. We can also add um, what's called a doc string describing the function, and it can be added as the first line of the function body with the three parentheses beginning and ending, and it can be multi-line. Um, and this is where you describe what the function does. Um, we'll see in a little bit that this is a very helpful to have a doc string because this is what you can give the user if they ask for help on a particular function, if they don't know how it works. This is usually very useful if you're writing functions for other people in particular. And then finally, we have a return statement, which is the end. Um, well, it doesn't have to be, but is usually at the end of the function's code. So if you want to return a value from your function, you must have a return statement. 
Um, but if you don't want to return anything from your function, such as, um, for example, the print function, you don't have to have a return statement. And if you don't have a return statement, um, the function would re just return none. You can also have an empty return statement, in which case you'll also return none. In the example we saw, the return statement returned the variable y. You can also return a constant if you would like, so return one. You can also have uh, an expression in your return statement. So you can do the calculation as a return statement and then the answer of that calculation is what will be returned. And actually that's what the textbook does in their first example. I split it up to make it a little bit more clear, but we'll have a go at doing it this way as well in a moment. Okay, so let's see those three things live. Uh, view. All right, so I said, first up, I said a return function, a return statement can actually be an expression which is calculated and the value returned. So let me do that. So if I wanted to, I don't know, save, save a line of code, um, I can actually change my ball height function so that it in the return statement, I do the calculation of the height. And then when that function is called, that value will be calculated and that will be returned. And I'll just run that to confirm that it still does what we think it does. Yep, all works well. And this is, this is actually how the textbook does it. Okay, so the other thing, uh, doc, 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 doc string. So let me put in something here. This function, So there you go. This is something that should hopefully be helpful to a user if they want to know what this function does. Now let's, um, instead of printing out my answer, let's also use, let's go help wall height. Okay. Uh, stop that. Um, let's see, run. Okay, so I've, when I typed help ball height, this is what uh, Python returned to me as a user. It gave me the name of the function as in the definition, but it also gave me the doc string. So this function calculates the height of a ball, inputs initial velocity v0 and time t. So that's the usefulness of a doc string. Um, if you're writing functions for other people, they can type help and they get to see that doc string. So anything that helps them use, use the function correctly would be good to put in a doc string. Um, okay, so one more thing is let's show you what happens if I don't define my function before I call it. So I'm gonna call my function here before I define it. And obviously the um, PyCharm has already figured out that this is going to be a problem, um, but because it's put the red squiggle underneath it, unresolved reference ball height. So it has no idea what ball height means. Now you and I can tell it's just been defined below. Why can't you just see the definition there? But that's not how um, computers work. They're very systematic and they like to do things one at a time down the list. And so if you define the function after you've called it, it is not going to work. So let's run that and we'll see what kind of error we get. Okay, so we have a name error. Name ball height is not defined. And we can say, all right, sorry, sorry, Python. I will define it first and then I will call it and everything should be okay. Okay, works well. Um, alrighty, so what happens, so I'm going to do something that's looking ahead a little bit now um, and we'll, we'll try and guess what happens and then we'll talk about what happens and why afterwards. So I don't want some help in that function anymore, but I perhaps it's important for me to know what the value of 
gravity was that I used when I calculated the ball height. So let's print out in my print statement, um, gravity was, and then let's pass in G as the value of gravity. So that when I print out the time, the height at a particular time, I'll also let the user know what um, the value of gravity was that I used to, to estimate, the value was I used to estimate gravity. So what's gonna happen when I, when I run this code? Any ideas? Oh, it's not gonna work. Name error, name G is not defined. So in this line of code, the compiler has no idea what G is. And you might say, well, actually I've defined G. G is 9.81. So how come it can't print it out? So what's happening here is we have defined G inside this function. It's a what's called a local variable. It's a variable that's local to a function. And what happens inside a function stays inside a function. So I've defined it inside the function, but once the function is exited, all that information of what went on inside the function is completely gone. It's completely lost. It's as if it never happened. The only thing that exists in the main code after you've, a function is finished is the return value, in this case, height the value that was calculated from this string. So anything that goes on inside a function is not available to the main code afterwards. So if we wanted um, to also know what value of G was, we'd need to return it. And we'll see how to return multiple values um, in a few slides. But that's a very key point to remember when you call functions. What happens inside the function stays inside the function. The main code has no idea all the main code knows is the return value. But what, okay, so what about if I change the value of something inside the function? So let's go back to my original function and we'll return y. But after we've calculated y, what if we want to change um, v naught? So we calculate y for initial velocity and then we say, okay, well, actually, I don't like that V naught. Let's change it. I don't know, initial velocity of six. So let's do some print statements so we can figure out what's going on. Whenever I'm debugging code, I like to put print statements everywhere. So let's print out what V naught was before I called my function. And let's print out what V naught is after. I call my function because inside my function, I've changed it. Probably don't need these now. All right, so I'm setting V naught, I'm setting a time. I'm just gonna print out V naught just to check that it is five. Then I'm gonna call my function. I'm gonna pass in V naught as an argument. And then my parameter up here V naught will be take the value of five inside this function, but then I'm gonna change it to six. So what is going to happen this time, do you think? So the first time around, v0 was five. I ran my function and v0 is still five. So this line here may have changed the value of v0 inside the function, but it didn't change the value of v0 outside the function. So what happens inside the function stays inside the function. But inside the function, if I change V naught, I will get a different value of Y because inside the function V naught has changed. So my value of Y will be different. Let me show you that by changing V naught before I calculate Y. Oh, I'm not printing it out, you goose. Um, okay. Let's see if I get a slightly different height from last time because I've changed my value of V naught. There we go. So I've got a slightly different height. So within the function, V naught is changed, which means my value of Y, which is calculated on this new value of, of V naught, is not calculated based on V naught of five, it's calculated at V naught of six. But outside the function, there's has no knowledge that V naught was ever changed. So when I print out V naught, this second time outside the function, it's going to print out five. 
So let's see some slides on that. Ah, so first of all, an error. Now this is an error that we saw um, before when I defined the function after I called it. And it's, an, it's called a name error. It's telling me that in this case, I tried to call a function called eraser. And it's telling me that eraser is not defined. So basically it doesn't know, the function definition is missing. And some possible causes are the function definition is below the first call on line 14. Um, and that's the error that we saw before. But it could also be that that function is inside a library and you've forgotten to do the include statement for that library. That's also a common way you might see this error. Um, and another very common thing is that the function actually exists and you did define it, but there's a typo. Um, you have to have the name exactly 100% correct. Um, Python can't guess which function you meant uh, like a human being could. So maybe the function's name is in fact array sums and you left off the S. Um, so it's an other option if it can't um, define a function definition. Um, a typo is always a good option to look at, as well as the case where you define the function after you called it by mistake. Uh, just some terminology reminder. We've talked about all of these things, but it's just here in the slide for revision. Um, function definition, function header, doc string, function body, return statement. And here inside the main program, um, the function call. This The function call is where we're using the function inside our code. When we define the function, these variables v0 and t are called the function parameters. They're the values that the function requires. When we call the function, what we pass in is the function arguments. So the arguments are the specific values we're using for the function at this particular function time function call. And when we call the function again, we might have different arguments. So in this case, the argument v0 is the same, but the time argument is different. So every time we call a function, we pass in arguments. But when we define the function, um, these are the parameters that we've defined for the function. There's a difference in terminology between the function definition with parameters and the function call with arguments. Okay, so I've just said that. Ah, and the Another good point, um, the variable names of the arguments in a function do not have to have the same name as the definition. So for example, in definition, we had v0 and t. And in the arguments, uh, we've passed in a variable v0 that happens to have the same name as the function parameter. The function argument happens to have the same name as the function parameter. But as we saw earlier, they're actually two separate variables. There's a v0 that belongs to the main program, which is completely separate from the v0 which belongs to the function. And because they're separate variables, they don't have to have the same name. So here the argument is called time one or time two, um, but the, the um, parameter inside the function is called t. Um, if they have different names, it makes it a little bit more clear that they're actually completely different variables. When they have the same name, that's where you might get confused in your code and think that if you change one or define one in here, it will affect the, the same named variable outside here in the main program. But as we just saw, that is not the case. Okay, we've said that. Um, okay, so this is um, talking a little bit more about what we saw before when we tried to use, uh, when we tried to change one of the function arguments inside the function. And it didn't work because function arguments are passed by value. So when we do that function call and we send in our value for t1, we're not sending in the variable time one, we're sending in 0.6 or 0.9, whatever the number was that was the value of that argument gets passed to the function. So we're not passing the variable, we're just passing the value that, vari that variable happens to have at that point of time. So function arguments are passed by value. And so you can think of it as the function gets a copy of that particular variable's value. So modifying in the, those particular variable values inside the function, doesn't change the original variable, not even if they have the same name. The function's copy occurs in a completely different memory address. So that's sort of the um, explanation for why, for why it doesn't work, that for why what happens inside a function isn't carried out to outside a function. Now, there are a few exceptions. 
Uh, one of the exceptions that's going to be um, most important for us is when it comes to arrays. So you saw last week that, in fact, the way that arrays are copied is a little bit different from the way that the other variables, um, like the reals or integers, are copied. And what that actually means for function is that we don't pass in the value of an array when we pass an array into a function. We pass in um, the address of the array in memory. And so that means that everything I've just said about what happens inside a function stays inside a function does not hold when we're using NumPy arrays, for example. But we'll see that in a lot more detail on Thursday. Okay, so local variables are those variables that are defined inside a function, are only known inside the function. So for example, g, as we saw earlier. And the argument variables and the local variables are discarded when the function finishes, when it returns back to the main code. So all that information is lost. The return value is the only thing that goes back. There is an exception. You can define um, variables as global inside the function, but it's generally not recommended to do that. Um, as you can imagine, if you're changing things inside a function, but when you call the function, you don't know that those things are changing, that can lead to all sorts of bugs that are very hard to find. So as a rule, um, not a good idea to use global variables, although in some small um, cases, uh, they can be useful. But as a rule, don't do it if you can avoid it. So we're probably not going to be doing it in Eng1003, just mentioning it as an exception in case you see it in somebody else's code that you might be using. Okay, so now some new stuff. We know how to, we know how to define functions and we know how to call functions and we know all of the terminology. So what we're going to be looking at now is just some, some extras, so a few different ways we can use functions that can be helpful um, for when we're writing our code. And the first thing we're going to talk about is the parameters of the function. So, so far we have used parameters, which have been, which are of a type called positional parameters. So ordinary par parameters where they're called positional because you have to get the position right. So when we call, when we defined ball height with the two parameters V0 and T, when we call that function, we have to put our arguments in, in that order, V0 first and then T. That's how the function knows which of them is V0 and which of them is T. If you switch it, um, the function will think whatever the first one you put in was V0 and whatever the second one you put in was T, regardless of what they may or may not be called as variable names. Now, if you want to avoid that, if you want to be able to um, change the position or if you want to do something in terms of um, in this case, we're going to talk about defining default values. We can use what's called keyword parameters. Okay, so for example, um, in, I'm going to define a new function ball height, and I'm going to have a third parameter g, which is gravity. Now, why am I putting in gravity as a parameter? Well, in some cases, most users might be happy with going with the default g equals 9.81, which I used when I defined this function first time around. But some other users might want to be a bit more precise. They might want to specify g, um, approximation for g to more decimal places. So we're going to give users the choice. They can either go with the default g, which is 9.81, and not bother uh, about defining it, or they can pass in another argument, a third argument to this function, which specifies the g they would like us to use when we calculate ball height. Okay, so, and we can do that option of either having a default value or allowing the user to specify the value they want. We can do that by using what's called keyword parameters. And a keyword parameter really just means we give it, we write the parameter g, as we did for the other positional parameters, but now we add equals 9.81 to give it a default value. And then the return function is exactly the same as before, but now we don't need to define g inside the function because we're defining it as one of the keyword parameters. Then we can call our function in the same way as before by specifying v0 or t, or if we want to be more precise about the height by using a better approximation for gravity, we can pass in the value that we want to use for g, in which case the function will do the same calculation, but it'll use this new value of g instead of 
Okay. You can use um, both positional and keyword parameters in your function definition, but the positional parameters must come first and then the keyword parameters. Okay, we'll see an example of those. I'll do an example of Python in a minute. We can also um, have a little bit of leeway when it comes to calling our functions. So up here, we were talking about different ways we can specify parameters in the function definition. Now we're gonna talk about different ways we can specify arguments in the function call. So it's the same definition of the function, but we're now we're going to be calling it in a couple of different ways. If we talk about a keyword argument in a function call, what that means is we are not going to just put in the value that for each of the arguments, we're going to specify what the name is of the parameter that we want to have that argument. So instead of just writing five, and 0.6 when we call our function, we're going to write the parameter name v0 equals five, and the other parameter, which was t, t equals 0.6. So we're doing exactly the same thing. The function is gonna work in exactly the same way, but now we're being pretty clear about which parameter we want to have this value. And the benefit of that is it makes the code a lot more readable. So if the, for example, if this variable name, if we were using a variable here and it was a bit confusing and we didn't really know if that was the time or the initial velocity, we can be pretty sure now from this code that five is the initial velocity and 0.6 is the time. We don't have to go back and read through the documentation of the function and remember what the order is of the parameters. We can simply, if we know the, the names of the parameters, we can specify the arguments in this way by writing the name of the parameter is equal to the particular value. The other benefit of defining the arguments like this is that the order doesn't matter anymore. Because uh, we are letting the definition explicitly know which parameter has which value, we can switch up the order and it doesn't matter because it knows that this is all this is this value always goes to the parameter t regardless of whether I put it second or first in the argument list. Okay, so you can use a mix of arguments. So you can use some positional arguments and then some keyword arguments, but the positional arguments as before must be in the correct order and they must come first. So here's some examples. We could specify V0 and T as positional arguments just by putting in the number and then we'll specify G as a keyword argument. Or we could have just the V0 as a positional argument and then we could have the g and the t as keyword arguments and because they're keyword arguments we can mix up their order and it should all work okay all righty so let's before we do that let's have some examples in the python uh, let's make this presentation mode Okie dokie. So let's practice some of these things we've talked about. Let's have um, define a new function, ball height two. And we're going to, I'm just going to put this down a line because that's frustrating me. Start on line two. Okay, we're going to put in a keyword parameter, gravity, and we're going to give it a default value for those users that don't want to specify it. So let's, we don't need it here anymore. Uh, let's not do that. Um, and in fact, this is going to be a function which doesn't actually have, uh, what have I done? Okay, someone remind me what that equation was. Um, Oh, what am I doing? Let me get the slides up. Uh, so I need v naught t minus 0.5 g t squared. v naught t minus 
g t squared okay view okay so my ball height two function is very similar to my ball height function except that now i have a positional parameter g where i can have a default value for g or i can specify g if i like so don't need these anymore. So let's calculate. Now I've got a red line under this function because this function doesn't exist anymore. Ball height is not defined. The function I want, which is defined, is ball height 2. So I can call my ball height 2 in exactly the same way I did before without specifying g. But I could also um, have a more precise height by calling it again, but this time giving a more precise value of G. So 9.800, what was my value of G that I used in the slide? I used 9.80665. Now let me print those out. I'll just do a quick print. One. without worrying about formatting this time. But if you want to format it nicely, that's code is available in the slides or in the um, lecture code sharing on Discord. So let's see, I've defined the velocity, I've defined the time, I've calculated the height where, where I'm happy to use the default value of my keyword parameter G. But, and then I've defined the height again, but this time I'm putting in um, an argument um, I just got a I just got a warning from um, the compiler that um, my function wasn't returning anything, and it wasn't because I forgot to write return y. Um, okay, so now it should all work, um, and I should get a slightly different answer for my height using a slightly different answer of g to calculate the gravity. Let's confirm that. So I got, it's a bit similar to the first three decimal places, but if I want some precision up to a more decimal places, I can um, do that by giving in the parameter of gravity to more decimal places. So that is an example of a keyword parameter. Now let's see some examples of keyword arguments. So for example, here, So in this particular case, um, let's see, T. Oh no, I won't put spaces in. Okay, so in this particular case, remember the name of my argument variable and my parameter variable were the same. So I'm actually writing V naught equals V naught. However, the name of my um, argument variable and my parameter variable were different. Um, so I can write in, write it in like this. Or I could specify it another way. I could write V0 equals, um, let's say phi. I could do it this way. I could write T equals 0.6 and G equals, but now let's shuffle it up just to prove that I can. Because I'm using keyword arguments, it should still work when I shuffle up the order. All right, let's see if this is going to run. Okay, excellent. It all still worked. Even though I've shuffled up the order, it's been able to figure out which 
argument goes with which parameter and it's been able to do that because I've used keyword arguments. Now, um, it, it won't matter too much um, when you write your own functions, whether you use positional arguments or, or keyword arguments, but sometimes keyword arguments, particularly if you're putting in a constant like this, which gives you no information about what that constant means, it can be much easier to read your code if you use keyword arguments like this, t equals 0.6, v0 equals 5. It just gives more information to someone who's reading your code about exactly what you're doing here. Okey-dokey. Let's, uh, what am I doing? Let's go back. All right, so we just went through some examples here of some alternative ways of calling the function with the um, keyword versus um, positional arguments. And there's a few more examples on the slide. Okay, so some other extension we can have to functions, which I mentioned earlier, um, which we can um, have is more than one return value. So, so far we've only needed to return one thing, which is the height of the ball at that particular time and that particular, due to that particular initial velocity. But maybe you want to write a function that returns multiple values. Maybe you want to calculate two things or three things or four things. And it's actually in Python, very straightforward to do that. All we have to do is when we have our return statement, we just list all the things that need to be returned as a comma separated list. Okay. And then when we call the function, we also have a comma separated list of the variables where we want to store those return values. So for example, in my definition of this function circle, I'm going to calculate the circumference and area of the circle, so 2 pi r and pi r squared. And I'm going to return both of those values, the circumference and the area, um, as two return values. So when I call my function, I need to list those two return values that I need, that I'm going to get from this function. So I have to tell the compiler where to put the two variables for where to put those two return values. And then I can print them out. So, and I can have a list of as many return values if, as I like. Now you can um, in Python specify that um, you only want one of the return values if a function happens to return two or more, but that's not covered in the textbook. So we won't cover that in this course, but I can I'll type it later in Discord if anyone's interested. The other um, extension you can have to functions is actually to have multiple return statements. So I'm not necessarily a fan of this myself because I um, grew up learning to code uh, in a language where you, you only have one return statement, but this sometimes can be very useful uh, inside a function. Just be aware that when this function is running, as soon as it hits the first return function, it's done, the function's ended, nothing else will happen. So you have to be sure if you're using multiple return functions that you really do want to end the function and return back to the main code at that point in time. So this particular function, um, it's calculating the absolute value of, it, of an input x and it's just an if else statement. So if x happens to be greater than zero, it's already positive, so we'll return x. Otherwise it's negative, so we have to negate it in order to return the absolute value. So here's a, an example of a function where two return statements make sense. Of course, you don't have to have two return statements. You could just have a um, local variable y and you could write if x is greater than zero, y equals x, else y equals nine minus x, and then have a single return statement where you return y. That is also um, equally as valid. Okay, so let's see those two things in some Python code. Okay, so some code I wrote earlier. So here's my new function circle. And I'm going to first define the function. 
for my definition def, def def to say that this is a function oh it's giving me a lot of help there for how to define functions um, followed by my function name and I'm going to call this function circle and then my function parameter and in this case because I'm calculating the circumference and area of a circle I know that the parameter that I need is the parameter r the radius now PyCharm's giving me an error, and that's because I haven't included NumPy yet. Let me do that. Um, what am I doing wrong? Oh, not include. Import. So I need to include the NumPy library in my text using the import statement. Okay, so I've imported NumPy, um, and when you import something, um, you don't. Though that library is available both inside your functions and in your main text, so you don't have to have a new import function inside um, your function definition. You can just do it once at the top of your code, and everything inside the NumPy library is going to be available to your functions as well as to your main code. So I'm going to import NumPy as NP, and I need to do that because my calculation here of the area and the circumference of a circle, um, of course, needs the value of pi. And I'm going to get the value of pi, which will be defined in the NumPy library. Okay, so the point of this particular example was to show you what happens when I have two return values. So I have two times pi times r, which is the formula for a circumference of a circle, and I have um, pi r squared, which is the formula for the area of a circle. So I'm going to return two values. So I just wrote them, write them both in the return statement with a comma between them. Then I'm going to, when I call the function circle, I'm going to put in into it the argument five. So my radius is going to be five. And I'm going to return two variables, circ, which is my shorthand, shorthand variable name for circumference, and area, which is my variable that's going to hold the area of the circle. Then I'm just going to print out the values so you can see what they are. And I'll leave that commented for now. So let's run that. So there we go. It's printed out the circumference. It's calculated it for us. Uh, hopefully that answer is correct and it's calculated the area for it. So it's telling us what the circumference and area is of a circle with radius five. But that's a bit of a mess. And because there's been lots of questions on this in the Discord chats over the weeks, I'm going to explicitly um, tidy up this print statement by inside these brackets, which state where the variables are going to be printed, I'm going to give some formatting information. So I'll give a colon to say, here's some formatting information. Um, F means that we're going to be printing out a float. And the 5.3 means allow um, at least five characters for the answer. And the 0.3 means, and give it the answer to three decimal places. So this is a bit of a mess. So I'm going to print it again a bit neater by putting in some information to the compiler about what I want my output to look like. So let's run that. And you can see what the difference is if I use some of these, this formatting information inside my print statement. So it's given me three decimal places for each of those variables rather than the large number that it gave before. It makes it slightly, slightly nicer to read. Oh, presentation mode. One moment. <laughs> My apologies, everyone. Okay, so presentation mode. Here is, and the code is also available um, in the um, um, lecture code channel as well, if you are interested in um, having a play with it, or if you can't see what's on my screen, you can grab this code from the lecture code cha channel on Discord. But apologies, here I've made the code bigger. So I've imported NumPy, I've defined my function circle, and then I've called my function circle here. And the key point um, for this particular example is that I have two return values in my function. 
So I'm returning to pi r over here as the circumference, and I'm returning pi r squared over here as the area. So I can call, um, when I call my function, I have to specify these two variables, circ and area, as the two places where I want the two return values from my function to be stored. There we go. And I shall run it again for those of you who couldn't see it last time, my apologies. And so there we go. The first time round, this first print statement, it's printed out the answer, but there's a bit too many decimal places for my liking. So I've changed the formatting inside the curly brackets to tell uh, the print statement that I want it to allocate five characters for this float. And that'll actually be at least five because sometimes it will allocate more if it needs. Um, and I want there to be three decimal places. So 0.3 and then F is just to say that it's a float. So the colon means here is some formatting instructions. Um, and the 5.3 F means print out a float with three decimal places and give it at least five characters. If I were to give it 15 characters, it would give it 15 characters. And so there would be a lot of extra space. Let's try that. So here we go. I've given it 15. I've said you must use 15 characters for the circumference and for the area. So it's given it 15 characters, but it's only given it three decimal places which is what I've asked for. And you can use this number if you want to, if you want to make things line up. Um, if you were sort of writing in a column, for example, down the page, and if you had, um, you're printing out lots of numbers that maybe had different sizes, but you all wanted them to line up, you could make sure that every time you printed them out, you gave them 15 characters regardless of their size. That's what that number is useful for. Okay, so we have here shown how to uh, have two return values from a function, which was actually the point of this statement. Ah, and then the next example we want to do. Um, let's go. Is our Okay, so the second um, thing we talked about in the lecture slides that I want to give you an example of is a function where we have two return values. So let me go into presentation mode. Don't forget this time. So this is a new function. This function is an absolute value function. So it's going to calculate the absolute value of the parameter x. So inside my function, so first of all, of course, I have to have the function header. I'm going to use my DEF, my reserved code word. That means a function definition is coming, be prepared. Then I give the function name. In my case, I like abs underscore value. And the function parameter, there's just one in this case, which is x, followed by the semicolon to conclude the function header. Now, inside my function body, I've actually just got an if else statement. It's a pretty simple function. So if x is positive, then I'm just going to return x. So my function will, in effect, actually not do anything. However, otherwise, else, so else for if x is positive actually means if x is negative, um, then I'm going to return the negative of x. So if it starts with a negative sign, I'm going to take the negative of it, which will, of course, then return a positive, the negative of a negative being a positive. And this is my function to do an absolute value. Now, in my main text, I can call my function. Uh, so I'm going to store the answer in my variable y. So y equals the absolute value of minus 3.5. So I'm going to try out a negative number just to make sure that it works. Okay, so the absolute value of negative 3.5 is 3.5. All good. Now let's have show you an example of where I can call this function within a function. So I'm going to call this function inside another function, which is the print statement. So let's see the absolute value of x is, let's do that. So I'm going to say, the, I'm going to Instead of calling this function up here and assigning it to a variable and then passing the variable in to my print statement, what I'm going to do instead 
is um, I don't have a variable x anymore. Oh, let's let's do that. Let's um define my variable x as minus three point five, and then let's pass it in like that. So I've got my variable x, which happens to be minus three point five. And I'm going to calculate the absolute value of x here, but it's going to, I'm going to calculate the absolute value of x inside the dot format part of my print function. So I'm calling a function within a function, which I can do um, no, in Python, no problem at all. So let's run that. And there we go. So the absolute value of minus 3.5 is 3.5. Very good. View, appearance. Um, uh, what am I doing? Full screen mode. Okay, so we've covered a few different things today uh, in terms of defining functions, but the key, the key thing um, that we've learned is this function definition statement. So here, um, our function is absolute value. So there's actually not a huge amount of content in today's lecture. It's just going through multiple examples of doing the same thing, which is defining a function and then calling the function. And we've seen some variations. We've seen that you can define a function with a single return statement. We've seen that you can define a function with multiple return statements. We've seen that you can define a function with a single return value or indeed no return value. Um, and we've seen that you can define a function with multiple return values. Um, we've seen a couple of different ways that you can specify the parameters of the function, either in the standard way, like we've done here, um, with um, a positional parameter, or we can have a keyword parameter, as we did with gravity, where we could uh, define a parameter, but we could also give it a default value, a default value for the function to use if the user chooses not to specify that particular um, a value for that particular parameter with an argument. Then we've also seen how we can have some variations when we call a function. Um, and that works even if it's someone else's function that we're calling, um, by the way, not just for our own functions. So when we call a function, we can put the parameters in as positional, uh, sorry, we can put the arguments in as positional arguments. So just happen to write them in in the right order, or we can put them in as keyword arguments. If we know how the parameters are defined in the function definition, what their names are, what their labels are, in the function definition, we can use those labels when we call the function to define the values of each of the arguments. Um, and when we do that, it can make our code clearer, more easy to read, um, but it can also allow us to mix up the ordering of the, um, of the arguments um, and the code will still work. Okay. Um, let me see, there was something else I wanted to mention. Okay, so you might be saying, oh, this is all well and good. Um, when, when, when would I use functions? Why would I worry about functions? The code, all the code that you've shown so far um, in the lecture today hasn't really saved me any space because um, most of the time you only called the function once. Um, and even when you did call it twice, it was only a really simple function. I could have just typed out that equation for the height of the ball twice. It wouldn't, you haven't really saved me any time. And for all the examples we've used in that, in this lecture today, that's perfectly true. These are all pretty much toy examples. Um, and you probably haven't saved yourself a lot of typing by defining functions. But as you go on in this course and as you go on in life, if you keep coding, that's not going to be true. Your functions are going to be more and more complex, more and more lines of code. Um, your, your programs as a whole are going to get longer. So even if you're only going to call a particular function once, it can still make sense to define it as a function separately from the code body um, and then call it when you need it. And the the benefit of that is not saving typing. The benefit of that when you're only you're defining a function that you're only going to call once is that your code can be a lot 
uh, more readable, a lot easier to follow. Because when you read the main body of your text, it's shorter, it's easier to follow. You can see that there are some functions being called, but you can sort of understand what's going on um, without going and looking through that code, hopefully by the function name. And even if you're not sure, you can always go and check um, that function statement if you need to. But overall, even if you're calling something once, it can still make sense to define it as a function simply for readability. Um, and if you're calling it more than once, it certainly makes sense to find it as a function, both for readability and to help you avoid errors. Um, there's no better way to cause bugs in your code than to use the same uh, thing multiple times, decide you want to change it, change it in one or two or three places and forget to change it in the fourth place. That's a really nice way to introduce bugs into your code that are really hard to find. Um, and functions um, are a great way to help avoiding those kind of problems. Okay. Okie dokie. So um, here's an example. So we're going to work through, this is the final example for the um, lecture today. And we're going to do the square root, a function which calculates the square root for us. Now, of course, that's already been defined for us um, in the libraries, but let's do one for ourselves. Um, and this is a little bit more of a useful function than the ones we've seen some far, so far today. So um, I think you did this, I'm not sure if it was last week or the week before, but you have seen this, this equation, this iterative algorithm for estimating the square root of a particular value k by iterating, by starting with a, a guess for what the square root is and then iterating through and making that guess better and better and better. Okay, so I've seen on the chat that there might have been an issue. Did I make a mistake with the absolute value function? Did I? Um, I did. My apologies. <laughs> I forgot what I called the function. So this is the, um, let me show everyone this because that's a very important point. Um, Okay, so what I did there was I defined the function with one name and then I called it with a different name. Now, normally um, Python should have crashed at that point and said function name not defined. But what I suspect has happened is that coincidentally, there actually is a function called ABS um, defined within function as one of its um, standard functions. And so it didn't crash. It did someone else's absolute value function instead of mine. And that's why it should have been an error because I used the wrong name for the function I just defined. And if, for example, if I'd called it abs values, let me use the wrong name, which hopefully isn't a built-in function and you should see the error. There we go. So I used a function name, which was a little bit different from the one that I've defined. And um, as expected, Python has crashed. It's told me that I was wrong. When I accidentally used the wrong function name that also happened to be the name of a built-in function, um, it worked. Now that would have been a very hard bug to, to figure out um, because it was returning no errors. It was just running a completely different function from the one I intended. Uh, but someone, some keen observer in the chat noticed that. So let's do it properly. This is what the code should look like. My function is called abs value. So when I call it, I should use the correct name abs value and it should work. So here we go. There we go. So that's what the, thank you. Uh, who was that? George in the chat or Joel in the chat? Um, both of you. Great spotting there. Um, that's never happened before where I've used the wrong name of a function and it's happened to work because there's an existing inbuilt function. I use the wrong name of the function all the time, but normally Python will crash and tell me about it. So yeah, going back, my apologies to everyone watching the channel, going back before when I did the absolute value function, I had the wrong function call in here. The correct name for the function I just defined was abs underscore value. Okay, so back to where I was, my apologies. You. Okay, so now this function is not an absolute value function, it's a square root function. Okay, and we've seen how to estimate the square root uh, using an iterative algorithm. 
And we've even written it in Python. And this is what we did. Uh, we started with the test value for k. In this case, we want to calculate the square root of 26. We have to start with a initial guess for what we think the square root is. Um, it doesn't really matter what we pick as long as it's not zero. Um, but we want to try and pick a number that's relatively close to what we think the answer is because that'll make our algorithm converge faster. So it'll take less iterations to get a good to get a good result. So let's pick half of k as a good starting point for the square root of k. So setting our setting our start value, which is half of k. Now we're just going to do a for loop, which is how we do iterations in Python. And we're going to run this equation uh, n times. Um, and we can decide uh, what the value of n we want. Um, we'll have to set it as a parameter when we, when we um, write down this function. So we're going to call it n iterations. And in each iteration, it's going to run this line of code. So it's going to take the existing, the current estimate for the square root of k, which we're storing in a variable called xn. So this is the current estimate, and it's going to calculate a new estimate using this equation. So this, this, this equation here is just written in Python speak here. It's exactly the same equation. So for each iteration of the for loop, we are going to um, calculate a new, uh, hope, uh, better approximation for the square root of k in our variable xn. Okie dokie. So that's how we did it before without functions. Um, this time we're going to do it again, but we're going to use a function definition. Now, because we're defining a function, we need to make some design decisions. What are we going to call it? Let's call it my square root. Um, I'm not going to call it square root <laughs> um, because that's the name of um, some existing functions. And here I'm using um, camel case rather than underscore, just to show you a different option for function name. So my function name is my square root. The argument or the, the parameter I need for this function, which I'm going to pass in an argument, is k. We'll call it k. We could call it x. It doesn't really matter. And our return value is the square root of k, because that's what we want the function to do. So therefore, my function definition is as follows. We define our function. We specify its name and we specify its um, parameters. Now, in this case, um, I'm, I'm going to use k as a um, positional parameter. So I'm going to expect the user to tell me k. I'm not going to guess k for the user. That would actually make my function a little bit useless. But I will do is I'll give the user the option of specifying how many iterations they want, or if they don't want to choose, I can choose for them and I can calculate the square root of k using n equals 10 iterations. So I'm going to define n as a positional argument because it's a parameter for this function that um, is handy to have a default value for for the user if they don't want to specify it. And that's the kind of ones that you'll use as a as a as a positional as a keyword parameter. Okay, so the actual uh, fun the actual um, code inside my function is exactly the same as the code we, we saw before. We pick an initial value for um, our uh, answer, our xn, our square root of k. Then we do our for loop where we iterate over um, our estimates of, of the square root of k, getting more and more accurate. And then the function's finished, we will return our estimate for the square root of k. So it's code we've seen before, but to turn it into a function, we've wrapped it in a definition and a return. <clears throat> okay, so let's do that in Python. Okie dokie. <clears throat> so definition um, starts with the DEF. Then I have the function name, um, my square root. Then I have, um, do I have that? 
there we go. So I have my function definition, DEF, um, the function name, my square root, the function parameters, K, which is a positional parameter, and then N, which is a keyword parameter. Then, oops, that formatting, that um, it's not very good. We only want one tab for that. Then inside my function, um, I have my code. So I'm going to, first of all, I'm going to initialize my square root um, as its initial value. I'm just going to have say that it's k divided by 2, so half of k. Then I'm going to loop over my, um, my iterations of that algorithm and estimate a new k based on the value of the old k. Now, I've written the range in full by specifying uh, the start parameter, the end parameter, and the step size. But of course, you can have a start, start of value of i of 0 and a step size of 1 by default. So you could actually um, write it like this if you wanted to. But just to be clear, I'm going to write it out explicitly within my for loop. Okie dokie. Now I can then, I'm going to call my function my square root within another function, which happens to be the print statement. So I'm going to print the square root of 25, which hopefully we all know the answer to, so I can check that that's correct. And then I'm going to see that it works for a number where the square root's perhaps not so easy to calculate. I'll find the square root of 27. Okay, so it's always good to check your function with something where you know the answer to. And I know that the, the square root of 25 is 5. And thankfully, my function returned the correct value. And then for 27, that, that looks pretty close. So I would expect the square root of 27 to be a little bit over 5. Um, and I'm assuming that that value is, is a pretty good estimate for what the, the square root of 27 is. You can let me know in Discord if... Uh, how many decimal places that's actually accurate to. Can't tell just by looking. All right, so that is um, the my square root function. And it's a pretty useful, this is an example of a pretty useful function where you define it once, um, your square root, and then you can call it many, 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 many times in your code wherever you want to calculate the square root of something, which is a lot more efficient and also a lot easier to read when you're reading the value of your code because you can probably guess from the name my square root what we're actually doing inside this function and so if you're starting to write um, for example you know equation that might have the square root in it um, so you might say you know minus three times my square root of x you know plus y for example um, you can do that in your function um, without having to define what the square root of x is every time. Having to, having to cut and paste this code every time you want to calculate the square root of something. You can just write it inside your function. So let's, let's define a value for y. Let's make up something, 10. And that code is a lot easier to read uh, than um, if I had tried to write calculate that every time I needed it rather than just writing my square root or in real life just square root because sqrt is the function name for an actual function called square root which is defined either in math or in the numpy libraries so let's run that and you can see it's done the calculation for me um, and I haven't done it because I've just printed out the variable m um, as a variable rather than printing it as a string and doing nice formatting. This is why it looks like a bit of a mess. Okay, so that's pretty much all I've got for the lecture this week. Um, let me... Um, go back to...
So all of the code that I've run today is available in the lecture code channel in Discord. So you can feel free to cut and paste and play with and edit the code, see what happens if you change the order of the parameters, see what happens if you put in multiple return statements, um, multiple return values, um, have a play around with it and get um, comfortable with defining and calling functions. If you want to read some more, um, what we've covered in the lecture today is most of section 4.1 of the textbook. And all of the exercises in section 4.3 of the course textbook um, are useful practice. Now, I haven't yet covered uh, passing um, NumPy arrays into functions. We'll do that on Thursday. So those sections in um, the textbook and in the exercises that use arrays, I mean, you're welcome to give them a go, but I don't expect them to we expect you to be able to do them yet until we've talked more about that on Thursday. Uh, and there won't be any exercises in the labs on functions this week, but those will be um, in the labs next week, some examples of functions. All right, thank you everybody, um, and I'll see you on Thursday.